Robert Ustaros here with realagriculture.com. Uh, it is Thursday. We are back here today with another Real Ag Live. We're excited to be live with you guys as per usual. If this is your first time tuning into the broadcast, you can comment whether you're on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. You can uh, insert any of your comments, your questions, and uh, that's the best part about us being live. We're not recorded. We are live. So if you're tuning in now, Submit your questions and uh, we will get to them right away. So I'm going to bring in today's guest here. We have Jennifer Otani, who is with the Beaver Lodge Research Farm with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. How is it going today? It's good. It's going well. A little bit of snow on the ground here, but uh, we're hoping for spring and looking forward to seeding. <laughs> Absolutely. Have uh, it, It's quite wet up there. Have producers been able to get into the field at all yet? Uh, not so far, but a lot of machines being prepped, I think. And I think everybody's just waiting for that soil temperature to increase. So, yeah, we're ready. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and as the soil temperature increases, uh, so, I mean, everything starts to warm up and those bugs or well, those insects that were uh, overwintering are starting to come and rear their faces. Uh, what sorts of things are we going to be looking out for this time of the year? Well, you know, it's been an interesting and relatively mild winter for most of the prairies. So uh, this is definitely one of those springs where we're encouraging people to get out early and get scouting. Mild winters in general usually favor overwintering insects. So that's not necessarily great news, but, but that doesn't mean that this is going to be a disastrous season by any stretch of the imagination. You know, one of the things that we're really looking for for early season pests um, cutworms, I think, might be more of an issue than we've seen before. Again, you know, they overwinter. Uh, probably we're going to see, again, more issues with wireworms, and that's not really a big surprise. Flea beetles is usually the next spring pest, um, and then it just kind of goes on from there. So not to make it sound really dismal or disastrous, as I said, uh, it's not like we have long lists of pests, but there are definitely some things where we want to be scouting sooner rather than later. And certainly parts of the prairies have already started seeding. Uh, so they've already got seed in the ground that they've now really got to keep an eye on. So when we're talking, you know, cutworms, wireworms, flea beetles, what's the first one out of that list we're really going to want to have our eyes open for? Yeah, so usually this time of year, we're talking about cutworms. We're also, it's not unusual to be looking and finding wireworms, but I would absolutely be encouraging people to start to look at for cutworms. Uh, as I said, it's been a pretty mild winter. So many of our economic cutworm pest species, they actually overwinter as larvae and some as pupae. And so you can actually find some of those individuals pretty early in the spring. Uh, one of the places we start to scout, actually, even now, is if you're looking at some of those overwintered dandelions, those nice big long tap roots, uh, particularly if there's nothing else green in the field, I would be looking at some of those dandelion roots to see if there's anybody in there feeding, because that's usually a really great place for the earliest cutworms to start to aggregate. Um, you know, and there can also be several species of cutworms. And so that makes it a little problematic, but what we really want to emphasize is that you want to be looking in lots of different crops and be looking in general for any sort of cutworm. At the same time so, as finding cutworms though, I should just mention that people will find other insects. So that's not totally unusual. And so wireworms can often be one of those other pests that they'll find when they're scouting for cutworms. So there's lots of things and you want to start looking even now would be worthwhile. Speaking of other insects, um, is there any beneficials for cutworms? If you're out scouting and you'll see something else, can, can it be eating those cutworms for you? Yeah, so at this time of year with cutworms, it's really interesting because uh, we're pretty early in the spring. But even in this cutworms start to get mobile, some of our other insects, like some of our predatory insects, like beetles, they can be up and active. Uh, by and large, they usually are a little more active a little later in the season. But what a lot of people also forget about is some of our cutworms actually suffer some really serious disease outbreaks. So even though you might not see them in the field, 
Sometimes some of the cutworms that are out there and active actually are carrying some really serious diseases, which hopefully they spread amongst themselves. And I should mention, they're very specific just to those cutworms. It's not like we have to deal with anything on top of COVID. <laughs> but mm. some of those cutworms are also carrying parasitoids within their bodies. And so it's not necessarily a disaster if you're finding one cutworm. What you're really wanting to scout for at this point is whether or not you've got them and then starting to figure out what kinds of densities are out there. So yeah, there so are beneficials out there. What sort of thresholds are available for cutworms? Like what, when are we looking at those action and economic thresholds? Yeah, so cutworms actually has a long, they're a long list of species in fact. And so that's sometimes daunting to growers, but because there are several species, some of those species are actually fairly specific on cereals, for example, or on broadleaves. So it's really important to kind of figure out hopefully what species of cutworm you've got and also look at the host crop that you intend to have in that field or have in that field. And so there are actually different thresholds for cutworm densities in different crops. And part of that is related to the fact that some of these crops have very different tolerances to feeding damage. So there's actually quite a long list of thresholds. So sometimes it's four or five per square foot for alfalfa. When we talk about canola, there's a nominal threshold of about 25 to 30% of the stand being reduced in density. There can actually be quite a, a variety. Manitoba agriculture, and I know I should be uh, promoting all of our prairie provinces and especially Alberta, but I have to say Manitoba agriculture has one of the best summaries of the various cutworm thresholds for the different crops. So I'd really urge people to go take a look at that site because the numbers do vary according to crop. Absolutely. And and when we're talking cutworms, what sort of conditions do they do they thrive most in? Yeah, so I mean that's a really good question. And for those of us that have tried to be studying cutworms over many years, it's always uh in the end, the insect always knows best. But by and large, when we talk about mild winters like we've just had, one of the issues there is the fact that it, some of our cutworm species are overwintering as larvae. So when we get these really dramatic temperature changes during really deep cold winters, um, by and large, we're usually hoping that that actually has an effect on mortality of those overwintering larvae. Um, instead though, we've had a pretty mild winter and we're starting to see a fairly early spring that actually started out quite warm despite today's snow on the ground. So those situations are usually actually a little bit, um, by and large, favorable for cutworms. So that's not great news, but what it is, what's really important is that people get out and start scouting for them. Um, so some of these cutworm species, you wanna take a good look at, you know, consider how much vegetation you had on that field last late summer, last fall. And if you had a lot of thatch that overwintered, uh, sometimes that's a great condition because those cutworms are actually doubly insulated, not just under the snow, but also underneath that thatch of vegetation. So that's a place that you wanna start your scouting. Um, and then for those of you that have already seeded and have seed in the ground, you know, right away you need to be watching for anything that's not emerging. And for areas of the prairies where it's maybe a bit drier this spring, you know, those are often growers that we really encourage you to in fact, get out and scout more don't be waiting for moisture and don't think that it's growing conditions that's holding your seed underground. Quite often that's the situation where if there are cutworms, uh, they're feeding quite quickly on seed that's maybe struggling in the ground. So those are definitely situations that you wanna definitely catch sooner rather than later. Yeah, absolutely. Those cutworms can, I know it's, and I've heard before that sometimes you're looking on your hills for cutworms too. Is that is that the case or? Yeah, so sometimes it's on the rises. Sometimes it's also a factor of moisture. So, you know, it's not necessarily, not necessarily the low spots, sorry. <laughs> but it's also, you know, I always say to growers, if it's not greening up like you, you expect it to, or if you're not getting seed out of the ground like you think you should, that is absolutely don't wait. You know, go start to go look around and and really start scouting. And you have to be prepared to dig a bit for, for cutworms. There are some species of climbing cutworms that actually come up later, like at dusk, and maybe really early in the morning, they can still be above ground feeding. Uh, 
but there also are some subterranean species of cutworms. And that means that they really feed under the soil surface and they're feeding on the roots. So scouting for those individuals, as you can imagine, you really do have to be prepared to dig around a little bit. Oh man. So that's as probably if, the key thing. As if cutworms weren't enough. Now we got climbing cutworms. <laughs> So well, you know, a good example of climbing cutworm is Bertha armyworm. So, you know, these are, uh, you know, hopefully growers are appreciating these are not necessarily new species. It's just how we describe them or characterize some of their behaviors. And, you know, if you're going to have a cutworm, I'm also kind of always happy when it's a climbing cutworm because you do have a better chance of encountering them because they will come up and feed above the soil surface. You know, some of these subterranean species that we've seen in our grass seed production stands, uh, they are really challenging because not only are you digging in a big thatch, you've got a huge crown to maybe excavate. And some of those individuals, they stay right in the bottom well, center of the crown. They pull the green vegetation down and you really only see things browning off or green vegetation disappearing they are really hard to scout for. So, you know, it's a real challenge for growers we can appreciate. Yeah. And looking at Bertha armyworm, now that's, it's not really an early season insect, of course, but correct me if I'm wrong, a couple of years ago in the piece, you guys really saw a lot of Bertha, Bertha armyworm, right? Yeah, we did. Two years ago, we started to see some hot spots, especially around the Birch Hills County. And uh, last year, definitely we saw uh, some pockets of some high densities. Um, there definitely was some insecticide applications to try and manage some of those populations. I think for those growers that had problems last year, again, you know, this year you should be scouting and be on the watch for Bertha. It's usually a pest that when it appears, it's kind of on a three year outbreaking cycle. And when I say outbreaking, I mean really high numbers that are warranting some, some control. Um, I think the real question will be how mild was the winter, how many of those individuals will, will manage as pupae, and we'll have to really carefully be watching pheromone traps that are deployed in the, the sort of early, early summer and looking at what those numbers are looking like, because that's a really a good indication for our relative risk as larvae start to appear in fields. So hopefully people are keeping a good eye on that. And, you know, I just want to mention really quickly, too, uh, many of our prairie provinces have reporting for these insect pests we're already talking about. In particular, in Alberta, though, I just really want to emphasize that Alberta Ag has some of these maps that are live. The cutworm reporting tool is sometimes very little used by growers, and we really want to encourage individuals to report cutworms when they're finding them. It's not that misery loves company, but it's actually really important for us to document and get some sense of what kind of cutworm pressure is out there. It's also really important for us to try and look at it as researchers if we can mobilize some research effort. And if no one reports a problem, then it's really hard to prioritize research on cutworms. So maybe a little plug there for cutworms. <laughs> but Absolutely the reporting not. tools that are available Really, uh, we hope growers make use of them, and particularly with Alberta Ag, the cutworm live map is very much uh, a worthwhile tool to use, but also to be looking at in the spring. And how do they find that? It's just the, on the Alberta Ag website? That's right, yeah. And I'll give you some websites, uh, I guess, later after this interview is over, well, so we'll that you folks can maybe post some links. Post. You bet. Perfect, so, uh, okay. For anyone who's watching live right now, we're, uh, we'll write up a quick summary and in there we will uh, post all the links. So uh, be sure. And that'll go in our email as well. So a little plug there, sign up for our Western daily email because then you can find all these summaries from our lives. So, um, and as Lindsay says, misery does love company too though. So, uh, <laughs> well, I think it's, it's always really daunting. I think a lot of growers uh, brace themselves for insect pest problems. And in so many ways, obviously, I have a very different bias tack towards insects. But, you know, one of the real challenges is having a good sense of what's in your field. And in terms of management, that is really the fundamental question first. So we really encourage people to take the time. I know it takes effort at a very busy time in the season, usually. 
but it's really key to understanding what's going on in your field. It's not just managing pests. Uh, you know, some of the work that we've done with some of our insect pests like wheat midge has also shown that we want to be pretty careful in some of our canola, particularly if it's on top of wheat stubble, because there are some really important natural enemies that you actually want to protect. So, you know, there are implications to the scouting and hopefully it's, it's going to save you money in the end, but also be uh, more sustainable in the long run. You mentioned about the birth of armyworm, and I do want to just also mention the pheromone trap monitoring that happens in the spring and early summer. So many cooperators across the prairies, but especially in Alberta, those individuals are involved in reporting weekly numbers, and we really want to acknowledge the fact that those individuals are doing a huge thing for our growers. It enables people to have a sense and look at these live maps to get some some sense of risk and hopefully also prompt them to maybe do more scouting at critical times, particularly when we see emerging insect pest situations on the rise. So it's really important that people do stay plugged in. I know there's a lot out there, but it's really important. Yep, totally. And and when we're talking, Bertha, because it, it is, it has become such a big problem in certain patches. When are we really looking out for, like, what's the timing on that? Yeah, so Bertha armyworm, it's, of course, the larvae that are causing the damage. So essentially, we typically see the pheromone traps going out kind of late spring, uh, early, mid-summer kind of thing. Um, usually end of June in a typical year. It's very much... Uh, tied to degree day heat units. But yeah, it's usually pretty early in July that we can start to detect some of those populations of larvae. And of course, you know, with, with Bertha armyworm, it's defoliation. If you have some of these large populations, as the larvae start to mature, uh, they're not only feeding on leaves, but then they're also starting to feel, feed on developing pods. And I have have sat there and watched a fairly mature larvae pluck every seed out of a canola pod as it's feeding. It's really um, not a great feeling, but they are impressive. And of course, you know, the key thing that we really want to emphasize with Bertha is you can't use the pheromone trap numbers to dictate whether or not you're actually going to have to implement control. It really is number of larvae per field. And with Bertha, they can be somewhat coalesced in one field. Uh, you know, I have heard of some people having no problem right beside a field that absolutely had a huge outbreak. And so field by field, it can vary. And this is why the scouting is so critical. Yeah, totally. And we're at, well, we're looking at other things this time of the year. We're at the time of the year. We're looking for wire worms. Do you have any experience with bait balls? And and if so, oh. can you walk producers around <laughs> how yeah. you make a bait ball? Yeah, so I'm laughing because uh, I think all of us have had some experience with bait balls and they they can work well for some people and they can work not at all. And, and that's my own personal experience too. Um, there are some great recipes. I think I, I'm more interested in having people really scouting their stands rather than doing a lot of bait balling simply because I personally have such variable success if you will. Uh, one of the things that's really exciting to me though is that there is some really great work with pheromones and looking at using pheromones first of all to monitor wireworm populations but even to be specific enough to detect whether or not we have some of the of species that traditionally cause more economic damage maybe than some of our native uh, wireworm species. And so we're actually involved in some of that work with uh, Dr. Wim Van Herk out of Ag Canada and Agassiz. Of course, I think you probably have talked with Haley Catton too in Southern Alberta. You know, some of the work with the pheromones we're really encouraged with because as you say, uh, bait balls are, are an experience. But, you know, with scouting for wireworms, it's really keeping an eye on your germinating seed. It's keeping an eye on whether or not things are greening up. And one of the real challenges there is actually just, again, digging and trying to find individuals. Now, wireworm larvae are super difficult. The adults are even difficult to find. Uh, so it is a challenge. But this is where I'm saying to you there is hope. Uh, some of the data I've seen with the pheromone work is really encouraging. So fingers crossed 
because I'm I'm not a big fan of eight balls. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> And that's, that's fair. It was definitely, uh, I know I've tried making them before. I think I've been out in the field with Jeremy Boychin with Alberta Wheat and we've tried to make them and sometimes they work and sometimes well, and they don't you know, is, is a very good way of putting it. Yeah. And they work on the principle of, you know, fermentation and the germination process and the physiology and the gases that are released by the bait ball are attractive to wireworms. The thing is, unless you have the moisture and the temperature and the densities, and unless you put those bait balls out at the right time, you can have extremely varying success. And, and I think Wim and Haley would probably have to agree with that too. It, it's a really difficult complex. And the other thing with wireworms, you know, please remember that we're also dealing with several species there. And some of those species have very long life cycles, like years. So it's a real challenge, but I, I'm telling you, there is some hope and that's always encouraging. So let's talk um, conditions with them as well. What, what sort of conditions do these wireworms enjoy? Yeah, so wireworms are super challenging because as larvae, uh, they will move up and down in the soil profile. So, you know, their normal biology dictates that they're moving up and down. They have periods where they're feeding more actively, so they're coming up towards the surface. Uh, you know, by and large, again, if we're talking about these overwintered adults and the overwintering larvae that are deep in the soil profile, you know, sometimes temperature may not have a big impact on larvae because they can move meters in the soil profile. So they're not really experiencing those big fluctuations in temperature or moisture the way something like um, ligus bug that overwinters, you know, just in that leaf litter on the top. Um, some of the adults, of course, might be a little more susceptible because that's usually where they're more so overwintering. But yeah, mild winters in general are not great news for some of our insect pests because they do tend to do, they tend to come through the winter a little bit better. Let's put it that way. Now it's, I, I hate to bring up the uh, the F word, the flea beetles. Um, they're <laughs> something yeah. that lots of producers are thinking about this time of year because they can to your canola crop, they really can be detrimental. Um, what yeah. what sorts of things are we looking out for at this time of the year when it comes to those flea beetles? Yeah, so at this point in the season, it's always impressive to me. Uh, flea beetles become active as soon as it's warm enough. I think on Twitter, we've seen a, a few pictures. I, I think Boyd Moore even had some pictures even last week. Uh, so it's not unusual. They're active very early in the spring. They overwinter as adults, and that's part of why they are present so quickly as soon as the temperatures increase and they can be up and around. You know, what we usually tell growers is that it's really important to be aware if you can see flea beetles on some of your volunteer weeds right now, uh, you want to keep track of that because when you can see them early in the spring, that's not always great news. However, between your volunteer weeds and where your actual canola is seeded, sometimes those can be quite a distance apart and be quite disconnected. So again, the infield scouting is really important. And I'm sorry, I keep saying it, but it really is so vital. Uh, with flea beetles, there are the two main species that we traditionally battle in canola, and that is the striped flea beetles and the crucifer flea beetles. With striped flea beetles, uh, I think most people have seen some pictures by now, hopefully, you know, the nice yellow stripe on the backside. Um, on either side of the elytra. Uh, they're very active, but the biggest thing is uh, seed enough canola seed <laughs> um, and really start to do that infield scouting. Uh, we hear some reports of some growers because of various reasons, they are pushing their seeding rates quite low. And in years where you are dealing with high populations of flea beetles, that can be just such a difficult situation to manage. Um, but, you know, as soon as that seed is out there, as soon as it's starting to poke its head out, that's when really the scouting has to start in earnest. I have seen damage happen in less than six hours in a field, uh, so much so that it moved it right up to the action threshold of 25% of the cotyledon leaf area being eaten. Uh, what we also start to see in cool, dry, windy springs is sometimes our flea beetles will not necessarily feed in that traditional shot hole feeding pattern on the cotyledons. Uh, 
Sometimes they will be on the undersides and sometimes on the stems. Those are really difficult numbers and densities to manage, but the main thing is that growers really have to be scouting and scouting quite thoroughly and don't just leave it. I think that's the key thing with flea beetles. Yeah. Um, you know, I should mention too, uh, some areas of the prairies are not necessarily dealing with striped flea beetles. Some areas further south are often more traditionally crucifer flea beetles. I think what's been concerning over these last few years uh, has been the fact that we are seeing striped flea beetles in more of the prairies. And certainly, you know, it's not that it's not that they feed exactly differently, although there's some question of how the amounts individuals will eat. But the key thing is really the scouting and maintaining that action threshold and, and being aware of it. So as I said, I've seen in six hours bad things happened. I know it is amazing. That's 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 the one amazing thing about flea beetles that I always find too. How you can go from oh we have an okay situation to it's out of control. <laughs> so uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and how about how about conditions there? They they tend to prefer the drier conditions, correct? Well, let me. Or is yes that a, and no. A first right <laughs> sort of situation too. Yeah. Well, and some of the geography and the prevailing weather patterns, you're right. I mean, traditionally, some of the striped flea beetle versus crucifer flea beetle habitats have been kind of described as being uh, more wet versus more dry. I think the key thing here is really the growing conditions, though. Uh, where I've seen the worst flea beetle damage was where it was a dry spring and it was warm and there were just high, high densities of flea beetles. Um, you know, when plants can't grow quickly, when they have no resources to keep um, developing, it's a really bad situation. So couple that with high densities of flea beetles and you just have plants that can't compete. And this is where I'm saying to growers, you know, I know seed is super expensive, but, you know, going with the very lowest seeding rate is not necessarily going to be a great situation if you have these outbreaks of flea beetles. You know, so often we see growers dealing with not just one insect pest, it may be flea beetles in the spring. So then your plant density goes down a bit more. Well, then that means maybe your weed population has a chance to rebound. But then it's some of these things compound because sometimes we see these really uh, struggling stands, they flower a little later, um, which means then, you know, then we have another insect problem that maybe is happening just because that stand is struggling and under so much pressure and really not able to tolerate much. So, you know, a good agronomy really is fundamental to insect pest management. Um, that probably sounds really strange for an entomologist to say, but it is true. If you don't have your plants and they're not growing well, uh, you've got really big problems. Wow, oh, yeah, there's, uh, and I've seen some of those years that, like you said, like where it's terrible flea beetles at the beginning when they're all the crops small and it just seems like you're battling all year long because then you get all those stagey crops and no, oh, it's, <laughs> let's not do that. <laughs> Would be great. Yeah, well, and I think this is the thing that I, I know... I feel like sometimes growers are looking for all, all the, they're trying to line up all the easy answers and, you know, agriculture doesn't work that way sometimes. You really have to, you know, it's a long game and you really have to plan for it. So, you know, as I said, seeding rates can be important. I think with flea beetles, if you're looking at a, a dry spring and if you don't have great soil temperatures to get those seedlings up and going, uh, it's probably maybe not the spring to be cutting your seeding rates too low. Mm -hmm. And Lara's asking There's a question. You're going to get criticisms. Sorry, you cut out there. Do you want to repeat what you just said at the end? Well, I was just going to say, I'm sure you're going to get comments because, uh, you know, uh, seed is expensive and we get that, but it, it is such an important management tool in terms of establishing your, your crop. Well, and, and not just for canola. Good. Yeah, and if you can't get it established, then that's that's half the battle, right? They talk about that with all those crops. But uh, so Lara has a question, and I am disappointed in myself because I always like to ask my entomologists I have on this question, and I can't believe it took me this long. But she says, uh, I would like to know what Jennifer's favorite insect is. And Lindsay's adding, same, but pest and predator, please. So what's your oh. favorite pest and what's your favorite predator? 
Oh, you've caught me off guard here now. Okay, so my favorite pest, I always have to talk about Ligus because it's the insect that I studied as a graduate student and then actually employed me at my first job. So I, <laughs> I always have to tip my hat to Ligus bugs. I really think they're fascinating too in so many ways. Uh, growers, I think, see the one perspective of them, but they're a really adaptable insect. Um, they have such a wide distribution. Uh, they have such a wide host range. And they're really quite a prairie phenomenon for us, at least. Uh, so I always really enjoy Ligus. It's kept me employed for a long time. Uh, favorite beneficial? Was that what I was supposed to pick? Yep, yep. What is your favorite pest and what is your favorite predator? Yeah, okay, so, if, oh, a predator. Okay, so then I have to stick with a predator. Okay, so now, again, you've caught me off guard mm -hmm. here because my technician, found the most spectacular metallic blue carabid beetle. And I'm trying to remember, I think this was from a site that was just across in the BC border. Um, and I cannot remember the name, this is terrible. But it, it, it is spectacular and I will have to try and find a pictures that we can share with you folks because um, not, not only are they great in terms of having this regulatory effect on some of our pest populations, this particular species is absolutely the most uh, photogenic beetle I have seen in a long time. It's a very uh, pretty black with metallic blue. And I do have to credit my technician, Shelby Dufton, because she's the one that pulled it out of the sample and was able to ID it. And I will have to get a species name for you because it's uh, super cool. And you know, I have to say, I have like the best job in the world because we get to see some of these insects uh, up close. I, I always, I always feel bad because we talk to growers and they don't necessarily have the time or the equipment to necessarily appreciate what's going on in their fields. And I mean, this beetle is fantastic and it was in a field crop and I'm struggling. I wanna say it was in a creeping red fescue field, but you know, just spectacular things are all around us and they're definitely uh, important and worthwhile. So yeah, those would be my two and I'll have to get back to you on a species name. It has no common name. That's the other thing. But you did mention beneficials. Um, do you have one there that you would like to mention? Well, in terms of some of our beneficial insects, you know, we, we categorize these usually as pollinators, as parasitoids, as predators. Um, you know, some of our parasitoids and some of the work we've done with our field research, there are some really, really amazing uh, hymenopteran parasitoids with some very sophisticated life cycles. You know, some of the parasitoids we were able to collect and rear from cutworm samples, uh, they just are really spectacular. I'm always really partial to Parastenis. It's a, it's a genus that attacks Ligus nymphs and alfalfa plant bug nymphs. Um, you know, I got to work on that quite early in my career. So I'm pretty partial to Parastenis and they're a very small, tiny wasp, about three millimeters long. But, you know, amazingly specific and attacking uh, Ligus nymphs, and then such a cool life cycle. I mean, it's like aliens, which uh, uh, for better or for worse, it, it's part of what happens in nature. Um, but yeah, these parasitoid wasps then basically um, emerge from these hosts. And so it's pretty spectacular life cycles. That's that's pretty cool. Okay, we are running out of time, but before we wrap up here, uh, quick, I know I know insects are very geographical, but is there anything that's really on your watch list for 2021? Yeah, so I am based up at the Peace River region, and I think this year, uh, in addition to the the first spring ones that we've just talked about in terms of pests, I would have to say one of the things I'm waiting and watching for will be grasshoppers. Uh, the grasshopper forecast map for the prairie provinces does not predict that the peace will necessarily have high populations. But we do know that there is a species, uh, the Bruner's grasshopper, which seems to be following a two-year life cycle. And if that holds and if the environmental conditions are good, this could be a year to really watch for that insect pest. So, you know, early June, we're usually telling people, please start watching for grasshopper and nymphs. They're small, but it is time to look. So that would be probably the other add-on that I would say. I Maybe one more, if I can squeeze it in, would be wheat midge. Uh, there are some areas of the prairies that actually have some high risk forecasted. Uh, 
And up in the piece, we are one of those areas. There's a few pockets that could have some problems. So, you know, spring conditions will really affect many of our insect pest populations. So uh, I think be careful what you wish for, for good seeding weather, because sometimes that's not so great in terms of what happens for our insects. But yeah, we're, we're waiting to see how the spring unfolds. And, and what's midge timing? When are producers really going to want to keep their eyes out for that? Well, usually midge. Okay, so with wheat midge, we already have the forecast map out, so they can take a look at that. Uh, Alberta Ag, of course, posts that, and there is the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network's Prairie Wide Map. Um, but in terms of wheat midge, it's really managing adults. It's a very narrow window. So we're talking about as the wheat starts anthesis or flowering. So yeah, that's later on in the season, but the timing is everything with wheat midge. These tiny little flies don't fly for very long, but if they fly at the same time as the wheat is beginning to flower, that's where the problem becomes huge. Uh, essentially timing is everything. So yeah, add that to your scouting. And for areas of the prairies that are in some high risk, you know, try and find that map so that you can see where you are compared to some of the red on that map. And yeah, prioritize. Yeah, absolutely. And as Lindsay just uh, linked here, uh, it's prairiepest.ca. Be sure to check that out. Uh, that is like like uh, Jennifer said, that's a Prairie Pest Monitoring Network and you can find all sorts of uh, useful tools on there. But unfortunately, I could talk entomology all day uh, <laughs> and uh, this is all fascinating, but we are running out of time. So I'm going to have to let you go, but thank you very much for being on here today. I'm sure we'll yep. get you on later in the season again and we can see how things ended up and where we're at. But uh, best of luck as we uh, get out in the field. And uh, yeah, thanks for your time. You bet. Thanks very much for having me. You bet. And thank you everyone who tuned in. Uh, it's great having you guys along for the ride. And if you didn't tune in live, that makes me sad. But the fact that you're watching this later is great too. So thank you very much for tuning in. And uh, be sure to tune in tomorrow for Real Egg Live. As you know, or maybe you don't, maybe you're new to the stream. We are Monday to Friday live every day at 1 p.m. Mountain or 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, host Sean Haney and I usually take turns hosting. Sean is on tomorrow and uh, he's a freestyle Friday for you. So uh, we'll have all sorts of fun tomorrow. So be sure to tune into that. But in the meantime, thanks everyone for getting real and getting connected with real agriculture.